I changed the title to Going Back Over the Bridge, picking up the theme we introduced last week. Last week we presented the idea, which appears to be behind the letters of Dionysius, that here was a vast Hellenic culture, profound, especially vast. We're at 529 AD, the collapse of the Hellenic age and all philosophy, public teaching of philosophy. The philosophers are exiled to Syria. <clears throat> Two years later, year and a half later or so, they discover these letters. It's passed off as being authored by the companion of St. Paul. There was some disagreement at the time, but they overcame it. And therefore, these letters and the two writings that he had accompanied it entered into Christian thought. What they did was, the author, they perhaps, they poured that Hellenic tradition into ten letters. It had a profound effect. It Platonized Christianity for a thousand years. That's what it did. Actually, about 1,200 years, until the fraud was detected. Then they threw out, as you know, not only the dirty water, but they threw out the baby with the dirty water. And that ended the study of theology under the assumption that this was all Christian because it turned out, of course, to be pagan and platonic. Well, how do we stand today? Well, we don't have a Hellenic tradition taught in our culture. It's not part of our culture. By that I mean Parmenides. I mean Plato. I mean Plotinus and the thinkers that come between these, but principally these thinkers. The vast writings of Plato, Plotinus, Proclus, all of that vast material was then dispersed. Didn't come back into Europe until the 16th century. And some of the writings didn't come back until the very late 19th, and some of them are yet to be translated. The thinker after Proclus, especially Damascus, is still being argued about, and we don't have an adequate translation of his thought. So now our culture, American culture, we are not familiar with these thinkers. They're not in the mainstream anymore. Christianity, as we spoke about on previous talks, is being attacked by its own theologians to such a degree that the most advanced theologians are saying it is a man-made theology and the basic writings are philosophical works of Stoics and Cynic philosophers. So therefore, modern criticism has now turned on Christianity traditional Christianity by their own thinkers, and that too has suffered an eclipse. Now is it interesting now to consider that at the close of this Hellenic, Hellenic, Hellenic period, or Hellenistic period, Dionysius, pseudo-Dionysius, compressed all of these things into ten letters and created a bridge. And along which then this material could flow. Brief, and so it entered into Europe. Well, now we don't have really the great roots and the need for Christianity in the way in, in which it formally was required. We'd like to get back and take a look at this material, but it's so vast and alien to us that it's difficult for us to get back to it. Ah, hypothesis. Is it possible then that we can use the very writings as a bridge to go back to the past. Is it possible to look at the letters and see what we can find in it of philosophical content 
that might help us bridge that gap and bring us back into a Hellenic philosophy. And if that is true, how would we do it? Well, that's the goal for tonight. So, let me repeat them. If all of these works then were condensed into these ten letters and two other works, and that provided an opportunity for Platonic thought, Hellenistic Platonic thought, Neoplatonic tradition to enter into Europe, into Christendom, may it not going backwards allow us a compact and abbreviated jump into the past being guided by what may be the essence of the Hellenistic period. That's what we're doing. Now what's nice about it, you see, we can forget what was because we're really not brought into it in our own culture. So we don't have to worry about forgetting about Plato and Proclus since <laughs> we don't even have to worry about forgetting about it. It's been, <laughs> it's been a genocide against uh, the Hellenic culture. Now, what I'm going to suggest, therefore, when we look at these letters, why don't we just forget all the Christianizing passages, let them recede, use them occasionally, use them occasionally because they do have some good images, right? so that then we can see the process. Therefore, we want to recall by, re by focusing on certain parts of it, the process that's being introduced through these letters so we can learn the method of Pseudo-Dionysius because that method and that process entered into European history and had a major effect on its whole intellectual thought. So that's where we're going. Now, as you can see, if there are ten letters, there are a few missing here. One, two, three, and ten. Good reason, and I'll hold it back. So what I'd like to do is kind of direct your attention to these letters and I'm going to then help you see certain key passages which I think represent the key philosophical thought of Neoplatonic thought. If we can identify those, link them together, then that should be the material that can help us see the essence of this Platonic thought and use it as a bridge into the past. That's where we're going. So let me now, since you all have a copy of it, do you not? And I want to say again that notice the cover sheet. If you can ever possibly, if, if it's possible for you to get this book in its entirety, you should try to do everything you can to get it. It's an amazing book. And uh, Hathaway is the author. He's a very fine scholar. I had the good fortune of meeting, and meeting him and talking with him some years ago at a Platonic conference in Santa Barbara. So his name is Ronald Hathaway. And as you know, this is from the hierarchy and the definition of order in the letters of Pseudo-Dionysius. And we made a Xerox of just the letters. And when Hathaway hears about it, I think he'll agree it was for a good purpose. And uh, let's therefore jump into letter number four. Number four I have here on page 133. Now, let me, let, me, uh, let, me, let me give first a little, little problem. Very simple one. All right, very simple one. All right, good, good, good. Here it is. We are going to assume the following structure. There is a cause of it all. Sometimes it is called God. And where we're going, I'm going to slowly urge you to use two other terms. The good or the one. <coughs> now I want to put it now in cosmological terms and then pull it away from the cosmological terms. All right. At the moment of bringing all of this universe of ours into existence, the metaphor we're going to use 
is like an artist, an artisan. For as an artisan must have an image in his mind to create, and as this great artist here focuses on the object, which he may internalize, and then with his skill and his takes the object, which is an idea then, and with his skill he fashions a copy. And that is the creation. In a similar way then, God, in creating the universe, must have necessarily have had an idea, capital I, an idea, which contained everything that was later to develop and emerge and will develop and will emerge in its simplicity. There it is. We're going to call this the idea in the mind of God. Then God then, reflecting on the idea, then generates the universe And therefore, this is the copy, and this is the model. Question. Does he generate the universe outside of himself? Well, nicely enough, at this point, there's no inside or outside. That's true. Watch, you know, not, not true yet, because um, well, you, this is a cosmology at this moment. So cosmology means generating a universe, which is outside of himself. But insofar as this is an idea in the mind of God, it's not yet generated outside of him. Now, what's an important feature of this notion is that this, therefore, is an idea. It is an intelligible model. It's an intelligible model. Now, intelligence or, or mind just doesn't float around. It needs something within which it can then function, which is sometimes called soul. So therefore, God, in creating this universe, had to, then, had to then generate a soul within which then the intelligence and all of the physical attributes of the universe could then be put. So we then have three things. We have God. Right. Int the intelligible soul and then we have soul in body or this therefore is called incarnation how the, how the soul gets into the body or let's put it in another way <clears throat> See, the very idea of a cosmology is that if God is creating based upon this intelligible model in his own mind, how did it, how is it, what is this mystery? Because this idea is sometimes called a form. How did this idea or form get imposed upon the universe? because the whole universe exhibits the, all the order and the intelligibility of a higher idea. This is sometimes called the problem, again, of incarnation, right? How to bring something into being in a, in a universe. Now, take a look at now what we have in the fourth letter. Because this very discussion of how forms enter into matter, or in general, how out of nothing, no thing, was the cosmos generated? Well, it had an intelligible model. Okay, it had an intelligible model. Doesn't that mean then that idea, which is the model, had to in some way be imposed upon something? Something had to be there? And therefore, the form then is going to be imposed on matter. That's the problem of, of incarnation. 
lives, incarnation. You could take it on a higher level. We can now take it theologically and we can say the idea in the mind of God is the Logos. Well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the Logos. If that's the case, you see, the first creation must have been the Logos. The first creation had to be the idea in the mind of God. Therefore, that's sometimes called the Son of God. The Son of God. The idea in the mind of God. And the uh, Christian theology wants to say that that Logos, Son of God, became flesh. Okay? That's another incarnation. But the same problem. Same problem. Now, if we can solve the problem of incarnation in any way, if we can make, we can bring any clarity to it, we'll also simultaneously get, it, get somehow an idea of how the basic idea in the mind of God emerged from the mind of God as a form and in some way uh, generated the cosmos with all the forms of intelligibility which we know. That's the problem of in incarnation on yet another level. So the fourth letter. Right. Now, let's see if I make sure we have this. Now, intelligible, another word for intelligible that we've been using is, of course, mind. Same thing, mind, intelligible. Therefore, in the fourth letter, he talks about Jesus becoming incarnate. See, that's the way in which you can talk about this very process. Now, another way of talking about it is to say that the Logos is an archetype, a pure archetype, a symbol of all that man can be. And it represents within himself the full potentiality of man on the highest level. Then we have the same question. How can the Logos, as an archetype, possibly enter into the universe? How can the archetype, which is normally an archetype, is, sep is something separate from the way in which it manifests itself, it remains separate from the things, just as much as anything that made this chair, since there's so many just like the chair, there must be a model that stamps them all out. That stamp that stamps them all out is not itself a chair, but it stamps out all the other chairs. Therefore, it's removed from all the other chairs. It's a model. It's an archetype. But here, right, Christianity wants to say that that archetype also came into the universe as a chair among other chairs, as a man among other men. So that very issue now is going to be dealt with in four. Well, that's incarnation. Pardon me? Is that incarnation? Yes, that that's a, yeah, that is incarnation. Okay. Yeah. But it, remember now, there's a curious incarnation because it's also an archetype which normally is separate from the things that are made from it, entering into it, just like a ch the model of the chair enters in here and we can sit on the model as well as the chair. Gee, that's remarkable. That would be like if there's a prototype, if there's a prototype Ford or a BMW, that's the one you buy. You don't buy all the manufactured ones. If there is one, it may not even be one. <laughs> it could be then that would be the archetype from which all the others are made. But so, and the idea is that that archetype would also be a car, too. Yes, a man. Yes, yeah, a car. Right, 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 right. I mean, the archetype would be the blueprint for that Ford, not even... Yeah, It doesn't that's right. exist. That's right, as a chair. It exists, you know, on a computer that's disc. Absolutely right. That's right. But if they did have to make one as the model, what would it be like then driving the model? I mean, that should be a, oh, right. should be the perfect car. It's like moving into those homes, those model oh, homes that they use. Yeah. 
And this would be the model of all the models. What would it be like to try to do Okay. All right, <laughs> let me push it then. All right. I'm at uh, page 133. I'm about the uh, third, fourth sentence on the bottom, two lines from the bottom. For he is not a man only. He would, right? For he is not a man only. He would not be above being if he were a man only. The archetype is above being. Hey, you know what? Another word for intelligible. Another word for intelligible. We had mind, intelligible. Another word for it is being. So we have being, intelligible, mind, and sometimes they use another word, vitality. Pure life. Right. So, here we go. For he is not a man only. He would not be above being if he were a man only. But we define him as being a, a man truly beyond men in his paramount, paramount love of man. A being beyond being. Made substance according to men out of the substance of men. But he, but no less does he preserve his eternal transcendence of being in his superfluity of transcendence. See, that model has to remain a model. Therefore, it transcends, it transcends all the particular examples of itself. Now, why is Pseudo-Dionysius bringing up and introducing Christian theology? Why is he introducing Christians to theology? Why does he introduce this? Wasn't there before? It's a curious way of talking about it, except for one thing. You know what we're learning? We're learning something about ideas, aren't we? About archetypes, about ideas. While he's talking about Jesus, as an example, we're learning about this logos or this idea. So therefore he's saying, hey look, Jesus, oh, he, came, he, he then manifests himself in physical form, okay, but he's still transcendent, uh, right? Personifies those qualities on the highest possible level and goes beyond them since he transcends them. Ah. He preserves his eternal transcendence of being. See, of being. That's the one we just introduced. In his superfluity of transcendence. And truly coming into being, existence, made to be above being, he did the things of man above man. Well, now, okay, now look here. Let's pull it together now. What is he saying? He's saying that God then generated the universe, right? The soul and matter, right? And body, matter. He could only have done that because he had an idea in his mind that he created. This idea is also an archetype. That idea transcends all of its forms. So by talking about Jesus, we're getting used to talking about a language that is Greek metaphysics. By talking about Jesus in this way, we can forget about Jesus for a moment and see that he's really talking about these ideas. He's educating us on how to deal with these ideas. Now, why? Here's his reason. All right, I'm about... Uh, eight lines or so up from the bottom where the little number 10 appears on the left-hand side. By seeing in a divine way, one will come to know through these things affirmative statements above mind about Jesus. What will we learn? We will see in a divine way. We'll come to know through these things 
affirmative statements, statements that you can say something about. I can affirm certain things about, about the universe. I'm learning how to make personal, I'm learning how to make affirmative statements right through that sequence. Ah! Statements having the force of a superior negation. Because look at, watch what I can now say. It's a negation, a superior negation, that's a negative. Right? The Logos is a, the Logos transcends the physical universe. It's above it, it's negative. I can say that, that the model transcends all of its manifestations. Every order apparent in the universe as we in any way can conceive of it, the real pattern for it and its higher expression is in the realm of an idea, the Logos. I'm learning how to talk about ideas in a different way by using a Christian image. So that anyone who then wants to talk about Jesus in this way, at the same time as learning how to think in these categories, which have nothing to do with Christianity, but this is all Greek metaphysics. Now, I'm going to five, you see. So four introduces us to seeing in a divine way. That's what he said. That's what we're doing. Now, therefore, look, here. if we do that, we're going to then discover something. We'll come to know and to see something. Oh, by the way, the next letter. We should then, if we're able to talk about it, speak in defense of the truth. We'll be able to learn how to reason in this way, and our conclusions will be irrefutable because it'll follow this model. That'll bring us to realize that we can, in some way, by our reflections, elevate ourselves to the cause, the cause, the cause of all of this, see? The cause of all of this. And we talk about the cause of all of this we're talking about the nature of the good, the one, or God. That's what we're going to get in letter seven. If that's the case, what, Im what impact does that have on man? I mean, you and I, what difference does it make all this metaphysics? He creates a magnificent conclusion in chapter, a uh, letter eight. He says, hey, wait a minute. If you're following this, then there is an implicit need if you're following that, you're just following the sequence of all of this, to model on the likeness of God or the good. For there's no alternative. We must know. The more we know, the nearer we are to the cause. The good, the one, or God. I'm going to skip nine, go back to nine later. All right. So therefore, now we're going to five. I just gave you an overview. All right. Okay. Now, you see, we want to know, all men want to know, all right, how much of this can really be known. What's the problem in knowing all of this? Well, then let's see, all right, here's our problem. One, two, three, four. Now, I'm going to use the word no in two ways. I'm going to use it strictly speaking. If strictly speaking means if there's knowing, there's an object of knowledge, and the knower and the knowledge, object of knowledge have to be different. I also want to use the word no in the higher sense of um, an encounter with, participating in, realizing, becoming conscious, so I'm going to use it in both ways, and that's what our author does. So he's going to make a jump here, and he's going to make a jump here. That's where we're going first, all right, to know and to see. 
All right, I'm in letter five on 135. God is said to dwell, God is said to dwell in an unapproachable light. A divine luminosity, that's where God dwells, right in that divine luminosity, that, that uh, utmost brilliance. Hey, that renders invisible by its own excessive brilliance it makes it unapproachable <coughs> because there's a transcendent flood of light. Now look at the, what he's going to do now. Into this obscurity rendered invisible by its own excessive brilliance and unapproachable by the extent of this transcendent flood of light come to be all those who are worthy to know and see God. Ooh, hey, then this is capable of being in some way known. But would you not agree the way he's introducing it? God is in a sense hidden behind all of that brilliance. By that divine luminosity, by the flood of light, by the flood of luminosity, God is concealed. But the phrase that he has is though that, hey, it's possible to come and to see. Right? It's, it's possible to come to be, right? Come to be all those who are worthy to know and see God while they're neither seeing nor knowing him. That's the second sense of knowing. Two senses of knowing. I'm going to call that the encounter. And the other sense, you can't know God because that would mean that the knower and the object are different and therefore there can never be any real knowing. while neither seeing nor knowing him truly coming to be amidst that which is above sight and knowledge. So how do you get that encounter? It's above sight and above all knowing. Because you see, this is a divine kind of knowing, but the cause of that itself is not going to be an object of knowledge. For if it were an object of knowledge, it would be in this category. But it's the cause of it, so it's above it and beyond it. Yeah, 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 yeah. knowledge in the same sentence, two different ways. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to just look at the last uh, sentence. Notice the conclusion. Hence, hence he says, his ways are fi past finding out, his judgments inscrutable, his gifts unspeakable, that his peace exceeds all intelligence, as having found him who is above all and having known this beyond understanding, I think the word is intelligence, that he is beyond all things be being the cause of all. Now, if so, then, all right, then this is approachable. In some way, this encounter is possible, even though it's above knowing, and we have to discover in what way it is. Well, we're going to have to learn how to be very precise with our language. That's the problem. Have to learn how to talk with great precision. And luckily enough for us, that happens to be the sixth letter. The sixth letter on page 135 to 136. For it is possible, I'm on the top sentence, the second line. For it is possible that the truth, being one and hidden, should elude you. Right? Both you and others. That's possible. But if you trust me, I'm skipping down to the last sentence. But if you trust me, you will do as follows. You will no longer speak against others, but you will speak in defense of the truth in such a way that the things you say will be completely irrefutable. What, what, must, what must we learn? We must learn then the truth of things in such a way 
that what we say will be completely irrefutable. Ah, all right. If we're going to be guided by that, that means our language has to fit our model. I'm in letter seven. Well, what is this thing that he's introducing? What is this that he's introducing? This way of speaking in defense of truth. Well, this is what we're going to get in seven. It's a very interesting kind of thing. Now, uh, as you can quickly glance, you'll see that we have a long letter compared with the others. This is where the letters shift. Now we're going to get much more content as we proceed seven, eight, and nine. Because now he's going to get into some different kind of content. And the content is what's going to guide us. All right. I'm going to let the other issues phase back. I'm going to fade back all of the other things. Just keep the highlight. It is sufficient for good men if they are able to know and to speak that which true that which is true as it really is. All right? That's it's sufficient for good men to just do one thing, to know and speak that which is true and that which really is. Well, what is it that really is? That's another word for being. See, what truly is, is this word, being. Ah, so what are we being guided to? We're being guided to see if we can figure out this curious word, being. And then we have to find something about it and talk about it with such, in such a way that what we'll say and how we will express ourselves will reveal the truth, and the truth is going to be irrefutable. Hmm. All right. How are we going to do that? Thank goodness there's more to read. I'm at the last line on page 136. When an argument <clears throat> has been proposed through its own truth and remains unrefuted by all others, everything that doesn't correspond with it in every particular is of itself cast down by the indisputable status of the real truth. Oh, now wait a minute. Is he saying then that if I learn how to speak in this way, then by contrast, I'll be able to ignore and reject all else? Then he's saying this is going to be a standard. I'm going to get a standard for my reasoning in such a way as I can use that and then compare it against everything else. That's the standard. I can then judge whether these other things are true simply by contrasting one with the other. Ah, well, how do you do that? Well then, what must we do? Well, we first have to know about the truth, and then having known it, to speak. That's his conclusion on 137. So now, what are we going to get? We're going to now see whether we can get the basic idea of the cause. That's where we're going, all right? The fundamental cause. That's where we're going. If we get that clear in our mind, we can then use it to build these other things. Now, in the same way as before, I'm letting everything recede. And I'm at about 10 lines down from the top. I mean, Apollo Fanny's, did you see that? And the next sentence is, for it is through, that's where I'm starting, for it is through the knowledge of beings, well called philosophy, <laughs> they just kicked out philosophy, didn't they? <laughs> What's he doing? He's bringing it back, so he's saying, it is through the knowledge of beings, well called philosophy by him, and the wisdom of God by the divine Paul, that true philosophers should be elevated to the cause, both the beings themselves and the knowledge of beings. Well, what is that? Ah! 
true philosopher should be elevated to the cause both the beings themselves and the knowledge of beings. Philosophers should be elevated, brought up, right, to this realm, right, to take a look at this realm. This is going to be the thing they're going to have to master. That's philosophers. That's what they do. Whatever beings. Hey, do you know what being means? That's easy. Right? Would you agree the idea in the mind of God, which is the basis of all creation, everything that was, will be, has been, all wrapped up into a simple thing, that has to have some enduring quality, must it not? Being must be the source of all vitality in life, vitality in being. It really has to be the essence of the what's intelligible, another word for being, all of those words can be shifted back and forth because they're all hyphenated. They're not, as it were, separate and individual things. They're hy hyphenated. If you want to talk about the imbibing aspect of this idea, being. If you want to talk about its, its uh, cognitive aspect, intelligible. If you want to talk about it in terms of the way in which it can function, mind. If you want to talk about it, whether or not it's dead or it has a vi or, or a liveliness, vitality. See, these are all hyphenated then, and therefore it's sometimes called beings, plural, or sometimes pure being. All right, going back. The true philosopher should be elevated to the cause both of beings themselves and the knowledge of being. Well, what would be the cause of that? God. Well, as we said, did we say that God must have, the first creation must have been the idea in the mind of God? The idea in the mind of God, <laughs> that's an intelligible model. That's the same as this. Therefore, if you're going to look for the cause of that, that's God. That's the good. Therefore, how should philosophers function? They should be elevated to seek the cause of this realm. If they do that, what are they after? In some way, the knowledge of God. The good or the one. Now, being wise, right? I'm going to, I'm going to bracket a section at 1080. 1080C. See the little numbers on the left-hand side? I hope they're on your text. It's right in the middle of the section. Mm -hmm. But in order that he may not refute the opinion of others or unawares his own, Apollophanes, all right, now I'm going to pick it up. Being wise, we ought to, I'm putting in the word we, we ought to understand that no element of the celestial order and motion would be able to change anomalously were it not for its cause. Hey, you know what he's saying there for? There is an order established in the universe. It is final. It is put there. Any change must be attributed to God. There's no room for chance. There's no room for randomness. There is nothing in it except pure order, intelligible. Therefore, in this universe, in this universe that we live in, order prevails. There isn't anything other than order. Any kind of change must be attributed to the cause. Therefore, we ought to understand that no element of celestial order or motion would be able to change. The cause which produces all things transforms all things. Hey, wait a minute, it's not just a creator. We're adding a vital element to it. This is a transformative God. Hey, this is a transformative. Now, what does that mean? It means what it's doing is somehow transforming the very things that are being created. Ah, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. See, this artist, he makes a copy. It has no being, right? It's not in it has some aspects of, it, of copy. There's some relationship between these two. It has some kind of intelligibility. It shows some evidence of skill, but it's dead. You know, I doubt whether any painting ever danced. 
or spoke back to you, it doesn't have a low level of mind, right? <laughs> it ain't going to be there in a thousand years. Therefore, being is eternal. So, oh, ah, now look. Therefore, that painting doesn't change. You know what, if this painting could change and make itself better, then it would be capable of transforming itself which is obviously ludicrous to think of. But he's saying that in, our creative, in the creation of our universe, there is that capacity of transformation. The universe then can turn upon itself, and it has built into it the property of being recursive, turning upon itself, and transforming itself. Growth, development is possible. He snuck that in right in that line. Then how you know, should we not then reverence God, known to us even from this, and being really the God of the whole, by admiring the power beyond speech of the cause of all things? We are now learning something about being, what philosophers do, what their goal is, what they're trying to achieve. We're seeing that the whole universe, therefore, is ordered. There's no chance element in it. It not only is developed, but it has a transformative quality. If it has a transformative quality, then, then people who are interested in knowing can be transformed by their knowing. It's built into the universe. Eight. Ah, very interesting. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What does that mean if it... Like, let's see now. Let's see if we can take a look at this. If we live then in a universe right, where order, divine order prevails, we're in a universe where there is a cause beyond the intelligible that keeps everything in place, where there's a transformative element in it. Now, if we can be persuaded that this universe is also fundamentally and intrinsically good, that is to say, if God is good, what does that, how might that affect us? What consequence follows if we can make that connection? Order, intelligible, created in such a way that it has the capability of transformative, it's a transformative universe, we can become better? Ah, that's where we are. That's letter, that's letter eight. Now, what's interesting about eight is that Dionysius is now praising a certain monk. Now, now, watch the way he praises the monk. That's this man or anyone who wants to be like this monk. And in that way, we can get an insight in what's the dynamics behind the way in which he's reasoning his way through this because the issue he's trying to bring us to is if you do live in a universe like this, what implications does it have for you and I? Well, let's get into it. All right, this is uh, Demophilus, All right, the monk, letter eight. I'm on page 140, 141. Now, Again, now, I'm going to take a little liberty here in the quote of the last sentence on 140. He talks about Moses, talks about Moses as a figure to use to make the point. I'm going to drop Moses. I'm going to continue the point. But whenever they proclaim one's worthiness for divine honors, 
it is proclaimed because of that person's preeminent imitation of the divine good. He drops God, he picks up the Greek word, the good, and now, see, since built in, obviously built into the idea of good is good, <laughs> he dropped the theological aspect of God, picks up the highest idea of the good. Since all men desire the good, anytime they desire anything, they only desire it because they think it's good. Therefore, the highest good ought to be God. <laughs> all right, no, therefore, he gives us this great line. Right? That therefore, if anyone can proclaim the, the worthiness for divine honors, it must be simply because there's a preeminent imitation of the divine good. Now, uh, I'm on 141. I'm doing the same thing. I'm just going to carry the theme across. I'm a 1085B, that little number on the side, about a third down on 141. He who holds converse with God, the good, must model himself most of all on the likeness of the good, insofar as attainable, and must know in his own conscience, his own deeds, performed out of the love of good. Therefore, if you're living in a good universe and it has a transformative dimension, getting closer to the cause, if you want to know the cause, would you not then be getting close to the cause of what in fact is a transformative intelligible order which is good? Well then, what if the way to do this is to, as much as possible, the more you know about this, then to imitate it, to imitate the good, makes one nearer, closer, like, similar to the good. Therefore, go a man is imitation of the good. He's building it right through it, isn't he? He's just building it right through it. Now, he, he has qualifications, he has qualifications in here from 1085b, and you can see the way he does that as he proceeds. But I want to get to the conclusion, which is about four lines down up from the bottom, up from the bottom. But receiving in peace the God-bringing rays of the really good and trans-good Christ, let us rise on these to his divine good, right? To his divine good works. Is this not a sign of goodness beyond speaking and above knowing? that he made beings to be, and having led all things into being, that he wills all things eternally to be like himself. Hmm, look here. How did he get that? How did he get that? Look here, would you, I wonder whether you'll go along with this reasoning. What did God do when he created the universe? Let's see, he had to have a model. Right, we agreed with that, he had to have a model. All right, and he created the universe in terms of that model to the degree that it's a good creation. There's a similarity between the model and the creation, right? Here's the model, here's the creation. There must be a similarity between the two. Huh? Must be a similarity between the two. Oh, by the way, what's the idea? The idea is the mind of God. What does that mean? 
Well, that is very curious because look what we can do with that just simple notion, all right? That therefore God or the good wills, I'm on the very top of 142, he wills all things eternally to be like himself and have things in common with him, each according to its aptitude. Now, why would he say that? Now, let's stay with it, all right? Anything that's created, the, the copy has to be like the model. And the model is God, the mind of God. Therefore, he's creating everything to be like himself. Oh, he's making everything to be like himself. Then to the degree that it is like himself, to that degree he's an excellent artist. Ah, if he's the greatest of all possible artists, then his work must be, in fact, beautiful. Because beauty is a measure between the model and the copy. To the degree to which you can execute a model most perfectly, that degree they're similar. To that degree there's a sense of beauty between the two, right? Ah, what do you know? All right? Ah. Therefore, if God wills the universe to be like himself, then we, who are part of that creation, by becoming good or becoming like the Creator, like the idea or the Logos within the mind of God. What's that Logos? Logos is a principle of the mind. Huh? That's a principle, the exercise of reasonings, the exercise of the intelligence in the mind. So then, hey, wait a minute, by understanding and working through this, we're exercising the mind in us. We're learning then about how this was brought into existence, the principles of it, Oh, and now we can see then that he must will eternally all that which is going to be like himself. Why must it be like himself? Because remember what we said before, it has a transformative power. Therefore, it has transformative power to become most like the ideal. The ideal is the model. The model, therefore, is the thing which all things become like. And therefore, we're going to have things in common with him, mind, each according to our aptitude, to whatever degree, to that very degree. Now, this is metaphysics. Is there any personal element in this? This is where he makes the shift. From the metaphysics to the personal, he runs back and forth. I'm at 1088A, about six lines down from the top. God, Jesus, he, he nevertheless runs to those who receive him, meets them, and welcomes all with an open embrace. Hmm. Depending upon your capacity, the door is always open to the degree to which you can access it yourself. He nevertheless runs to those who receive him, meets them and welcomes all with an open embrace, doesn't accuse them of their former deeds, none of that, but rather loves things present. Oh, what does that mean? He loves the way things are in the present. Forget about the past sins and all that kind of stuff. He loves things in the present. Oh, why? And then he welcomes things? Good. He welcomes you with an open embrace, right? He doesn't accuse you of former deeds and all of those difficulties because you're using your mind in this way. Hey, what just happened in the idea of sin? He transcended it, right? He just left it behind. Is it just by the fact that if the good is perfect yeah. and, and one, yes. could and not one. have sin? Could not have sin. That's right. It would be two then. Would be two. Yes, at least. Yeah. <laughs> be dented. Damaged goods. Who wants a damaged God? You're right, absolutely right. He proclaims a holiday, calls friends together, those that are good, so the house is filled with rejoicing of everyone. Right, into parties, right, bringing good people together, enjoying, right, enjoyment, right, right, no more suffering and that stuff, right.
So now he's going to take the other side. All right, what about all of this difficulties with sin and suffering and all of this? I'm on 143. Then learn divine things fitting for you when the time is right by means of the ministers through whom you are deemed worthy. Right. Learn divine things fitting for you when the time is right. The fruit will drop. Right. <coughs> for the sake of order, and self-knowledge of being nearer. The closer you are, the closer you are to it. The nearer you are to it, the more you see. For the sake of order and self-knowledge. I'm at 1089A. Right. Therefore, there's this idea now that he's going to go into, which is an interesting notion, that according to the aptitude of the person, so it is that they see and experience. The more you want to then exercise your transformative powers, change, to that degree, you see more. Each according to its status, each according to the aptitude, each according to the work one has done, each according to the transformative force they put into themselves, to that degree, they see accordingly. the idea of justice. Everything proper for its own place, functioning on the highest level at its own place, that's an idea of justice. That's the Greek idea of justice. He just sneaked in there without ever once mentioning the word. And you see, one of the most important elements in this kind of philosophy is hierarchy. This is this is the cause of this, this is the cause of this, this can be the cause of this. There's a hierarchy. And as you proceed in your understanding, right, accordingly, you also change the way you are, naturally. It has a transformative effect. Therefore, there's a built-in hierarchy that the person can ascend. It's possible to ascend. And in that ascension, there is an appropriate self-knowledge, realm of experience, appropriate, and that's just. You don't get more, you don't get less. Perfectly right, perfectly appropriate. Each person, therefore, I'm on page 145, 1092, each person must heed himself, right? Must heed himself, forget your neighbors, forget comparisons. Thinking neither of things higher or lower. Reflecting alone on the things allotted to him according to his merit. Wherever you are, that's where you have to do your work. Doesn't make any difference where anyone else is. Your work is where you are, so do your work. And what do you get? Accordingly, as you work, so you see. As you see, then you'll make distinctions. In making distinctions, you'll learn how to make distinctions, put it into words, learn how to then uh, discourse in this way, and your arguments will be irrefutable. You have a model. Follow Everything follows from the model. I'm at the... Uh, 145, the last part. Each class of beings, each class of beings, each class of beings, around God is more divine in form than that which stands further away. Those nearer the true light, more full of light and able to shed light. Don't take it in a spatial sense, he says, but according, according to the sense of aptitude for receiving the gift of God. Therefore, hey, it's, a, uh, it's there being handed out. Get in line, get what's appropriate for you, and go on. I'm on 
I'm on 146 and 1093A. But to speak plainly, in all things there is a distribution from the first to the second by a well-ordered and most just providence for all. Ah, he's introducing the idea of providence now. Providence means that according to where you are, you get exactly what you're due, you get as much goodness as you can take, it's perfectly just and proper, and it is always in perfect intelligibility since it's, it's being directed beyond intelligence. Another word for providence, by the way, is dispensing the good or goodness. Karma? The, the cause of it, if there is a good, there's goodness. Providence. The dispensing of goodness is another word for providence. But isn't this the same as karma? Uh, it, it, if you have a nice, if you have a nice, sophisticated view of karma, yes. Yeah. There's a lower view of karma, which I don't suspect that's yours. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, all right? Consequently, it is those who have been arranged by God to rule over others who must distribute what's fitting first to themselves then to their inferiors. If you there have anything to share, first for yourself, then others beneath you. And what do you do with yourself? Now, this is where he turns it on the individual, all right? Within ourselves, <clears throat> we have an interesting thing that must be put in order because there's three parts of the soul. Reason, drive, what spirit, our spirited part of our nature, right? Not spiritual, but what drives us, spirited part of our nature. And desires that satisfy ourselves, sometimes called the appetitive, or for our own sustaining appetites or things like that. All right. Ah. Okay, but watch how he does it now. He's now going to say there's a hierarchy within ourselves Reason, spirited, the appetitive, their hierarchy, you got to put those, you have to understand those, you have to bring order into those, or if you bring order into those, then to that degree then the system will be harmonious, so the system is harmonious, that's like harmonizing all of this, oh, then there'll be a corresponding benefit for each level of success in handling those three elements. Watch what he does. Let us define what is proper for reason, for anger, for passion, and let him not judge his own order unjustly, but let his reason, which is higher, govern the inferior things. Let reason there become the judge. Let it become the ruler within yourself. Because, you know, aren't we ashamed when we see reason being treated unjustly by anger and passion, he says? When we arouse an unjust or unholy lack of order? For he who governs himself will govern another. He who governs another will govern a house. He who governs a house can govern a city. Who governs a city can govern a nation. Start at home, start at home, Start with yourself, change yourself, let the changes go from yourself on. Therefore, I'm on 147, define for yourself what is proper for your passion, anger, and reason. If you do that, then you are doing your own thing. So much for me on the subject of knowing and doing one's own thing or things, 
What must you do? Put reason in charge, let that rule. Put the others in view, put others in order. Therefore, there's a greater imitation, because if you do that, then you are ordering things from the spaces. One, two, three. Therefore, it is therefore time for you to seek out, right, uh, let me change that. He puts it negatively, so I'll put it affirmatively. Therefore, perfect your reason. He's going to conclude in 149 at 1097b. For this reason, an eager desire is roused in us for God the good, and always to be with the Lord and not to be marked off together with the evil away from the uh, most just. What, what, what must we do to endure there what is fitting for us of our own natures, the very thing which I fear most and account of which I pray to have no share in any evil. Therefore, model oneself after the good. Now, I'm running short of time. So therefore, I'm going to jump a bit here and get into nine. All right. He is doing something truly remarkable in nine. <clears throat> what he is attempting to do is to do... Let's see if I can... Sketch it here quick. He's saying, let us study the idea of God. Let's look at the plural, the ideas presented in religious literature. The ideas, figures, forms, images, of the divine. He said, let's go through them all. And he's going to say, if we do that, we'll find some that show God to be a drunk, intoxicated, doing all kinds of things in the Bible. He talks about the Song of Solomon. He said, there you have an image of a prostitute. How can that in any way have anything significant to say about what we're talking about. Therefore, what he's going to teach us is how to <coughs> translate these images and figures, no matter how obscene they may appear, through understanding metaphors and similes, right? through the study of similes, how to unpack it and understand it on a higher level. That's what he's going to do. That's his goal. Therefore, you don't have to take any theology, any image in the Bible, literally. You can then approach it as a system that you can understand. And if we can do that, then we'll be using our mind and understanding Christian religious literature, Jewish religious literature, Hebrew religious literature. We can take it all. We can understand it. We don't have to believe or reject it or accept it. We can understand it. Now, he's, here's the problem. Here's the problem, he says. When you have any one of these images, uh, let's take God as a drunk, right? Drunkenness. He said, therefore, what you do is you have all kinds of associations with a drunkard. You have them all in mind. 
He said, if you want to understand theology, what you have to do is strip yourself from all of these associations and look at that purely. You do that, he says, you know what? You're going to get an insight. That's the first level. For we must, right? For we, right? <clears throat> Because many people don't believe in the oracles, they don't believe in the divine mysteries, because all the divine mysteries have all of these images and they look terrible. For we contemplate, see, people, people, not us. We're, we're trying to get out of being people. For we contemplate, right, for people contemplate them through the perceptible symbols which have grown around them. We must strip these off in order to see them in themselves, naked and pure. we talk about a fountain of life, we see a fountain, uh, that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing something flowing into itself, looking upon it as standing of its own nature, having a certain power, one simple power, simple, self-moving, self-active, never leaving itself. See? If you just describe it the way in which it functions, see? Function is the key. Function, understand how it functions, then you can drop the literal, literalness away. Well, he has a couple of very fine examples and we should use them. Uh, when looking at God viewed from the outside, he says, you know what you can do when you look at you Look at all the number of incredible monstrous shapes they contain of God from the outside. Right? The transcendent generation of God as the stomach of God generating corporeally. Or the logos flowing out into air from a man's heart, which vomits it out. Spirit breathed out of the mouth and God bearing bosoms, embracing the Son of God. He says, you know what? He says, strip these images of the associations you have around them See how they function. You can see their similarity. You can then reach a level of simile and you can understand them. So let's do a couple. Um, uh, I missed one. I got a good one here. All right. Okay. Okay. Here. And what could anyone say about the risque titillations befitting a prostitute in the Song of Solomon and all other sacred compositions that attempt to render the form of God by putting forward and multiplying the visible shapes of things hidden, the visions of the divisions of beings one and undivided, right, of shapes and many forms of things shapeless and formless, now his comment. With regard to these, if anyone is able fittingly to see and distinguish their inner meaning, he'll discover that they're all mystic things. They have a divine form and they're filled with theological light. Therefore, let us believe that the visible appearance of these things were modeled. Right? Therefore, you know what we should do? We should see them as something that protects inexpressible and indivisible knowledge from the multitudes. If we can do that, then we're ready to pass in simplicity of mind and with an aptitude for the faculty of contemplation to the simple supernatural and more elevated truth behind the symbols. That's our goal. Well, then. Uh, Did I, um, okay, 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 okay. I was really looking for this really fine expression he has. Um,
Okay, I don't want to go there. Here it is, see, on page 155, three lines from the top. It's right, it was right, not only that the holy of holies should be preserved in their purity from the multitude, from the many, but also that divine knowledge should illuminate human life in both the undivided and divided in a way suitable to itself. I was going to talk about two parts of the soul, the parts that, that is passive and the part that is not. Let the impassive part of the soul define the simple, the more inward meanings of these godlike images. Now the passive part should naturally serve and strive towards these divine things through the shapes and the symbols. But for those who have heard clear theological teachings without such coverings that shape them, then you'll be able to see theology. Now let's see whether we can I, I'm going to quickly jump to get one. He's going to use the idea of light. I'm on page 156. He's going to talk about light on three levels. Transcendent light and intelligible things, and in a word, things divine, are depicted in numberless symbols. As for example, God is said to be fire. The intelligible oracles of God are said to be consumed in fire. Even the godlike orders of, of the intelligible and intelligent angels are depicted in various shapes and forms and, and fiery configurations. The image of fire itself is understood in one way when attributed to God, beyond knowing, and another way when attributed to the intelligibles, and yet another way when you're talking about angels, in the first, you're talking about causes. In the second, you're talking about substance. In the third, you're talking about the idea of participation. Ooh. New. No. What is that? Right. Right. First, we have to see things in causes. Then we have to see things in the substance, what they have as a substance. And third, we have to see things as participating. A participating is nothing other than becoming like the thing you are becoming like, becoming like the ideal you already have. We all have ideals. We all have images. And in one way or the other, we become like the, thing, the ideal that we have. The more this becomes truly an ideal, you're then, then doing what? You're becoming more like the ideal you have, more ideally. Hmm. That's participation. See? We participate all the time. That's not a fancy notion. We have an idea of ourselves, and in one way or the other, even if we comb our hair one way or the other, we're, we're trying to match it against some idea that we have of ourselves. So to that degree, we're, we are crafting ourselves like the ideal we have of ourselves. The greater the ideal, the greater the ideal, the more you'll become like that ideal. That's participating. See, the more, the more, the more you become like the ideal, the more you're participating in the ideal, the more you become like it, because that's participation. <laughs> the major philosophical idea of Greek philosophy is inserted here in two lines.
Now, uh, I'm just going to use one more. He has the image of the mixing bowl, which, which he got from Plato's Timaeus. But we don't, even have to, we don't even have to introduce that. Let's take a look at this idea he has of a mixing bowl. Now, mixing bowl is spherical. Right? And infinite dimensions. And it can be said to have twin it has two characteristics. Right? This mixing bowl, we're now going to give it a name. This is the way in which the universe was created. There is wisdom. And let's see how he describes it to give us an in insight into providence. Here's how he does it. I'm on page uh, 156, please. There is a beneficent wisdom beyond all things. It's a mystical mixing bowl. And it's, it's, a, it's a wisdom, and it serves out a double kind of nourishment, one solid, one liquid. Right, there's a mixing bowl mixed up in it. Right, there's two kinds of nourishment. The whole thing is wisdom, beneficent wisdom. And one kind is solid, abiding, always the same, and one flowing. So hey, you know what you have? You have transcendence and overflowing. So here's a mixing bowl, and something else flows from it, right, flows from it, and yet there's a part of it which abides, abides just what it is as it is. So that's solid, overflowing, that's the image therefore of flowing, right, abiding, flowing, that's all we need now, watch. There is a a nourishment, wisdom is a kind of a nourishment. One part is solid, one part is liquid. The abiding is the, is, is the solid. The liquid is a flowing. The mixing bowl furnishes perfectly providential beneficence naturally, spontaneously, unceasingly. Therefore, at the heart of the nature of reality, there's an overabundance of goodness. That's right there. That's an overflowing of, of goodness. That's beneficent, another fancy word for beneficence. Let this be a symbol of providence. Now he's bringing in the idea of providence. Over the whole, without beginning and end, which spreads out, circles all things. Therefore, the beneficence or the goodness of God there extends to everything in the universe. It circles everything. You can't get away from it. It permeates everything. It's everywhere. It unceasingly flows, and yet it remains as it is in what it is itself. So the mixing bowl stands abidingly, compactly. Wisdom, right, is said also to build a house for itself, and in it to offer its solid food and drinks and the mixing bowl so that it will be clear to anyone who interprets divine things in a divine way that the cause of being and well-being is nothing other than providence going forth to all and coming to all, surrounding all. Therefore, you're in a universe in which there's nothing but goodness. The whole thing is overflowing continuously, remarkably, unceasingly. And uh, it excels the whole, being eternally the same as itself, eminently standing and ever having the same condition in the same way, never becoming external to itself or departing from its own abode, motionless eminence, and all of these magnificent qualities that follow from it. That's a view of the universe, isn't it? He's introducing a whole view of the universe. Christian thinkers saw it, and I said, well, of course, this is Dionysius, who's the companion to St. Paul. Must be true. It's Greek, it's Greek metaphysics. Compact, here it is. What then is the solid food and what the liquid? Well, beneficent wisdom is hymned as giving these and having forethought for them. Forethought is another word for providence, having forethought, providence, <coughs> like Prometheus. The solid food represents a composite symbol 
of that intellectual and abiding perfection and sameness in which divine things are participated as strong, unifying, having an indivisible knowledge. The liquid food, I think, it's a dissolving stream which eagerly proceeds to all, conducts those to whom it nourishes in goodness to simple, unwavering, divine knowledge. Where does it lead? To simple, unwavering, divine knowledge. The whole thing, therefore, is a way in which to participate most fully in divine knowledge. And uh, he's going to use three, he's going to conclude with four terms. All right, water, milk, wine, honey. The liquid food, I think, represents a dissolving stream which eagerly proceeds to all and conducts those whom it nourishes in goodness to simple, unwavering, divine knowledge through, the, through things variated and numerous and divided. Now watch. In this sense, the divine and intelligible oracles, and this is an oracle. This whole thing is an oracle, and that's how I'm going to conclude in a few minutes. This whole thing is an oracle. That's what he calls it, an oracle. In this sense, the divine and intelligible oracles are likened to do water, milk, wine, honey. Water because they have life-giving power. Productive of growth, milk. Wine, they revive. Wine revives our spirit. Honey, because it preserves from harm, it preserves things, you drop things in the old days into a honey tub, and that preserves them, that's a preservative. And by the way, for some people it's even sweet. Therefore, a divine wisdom gives these things to those who approach it in the right spirit, providing for them an unfailing stream of good cheer. Isn't that interesting? Ah, you know how he concludes? Let me get the last part. Last, I have to get that from another sheet. Let me just pull over here and get it. This last one is somewhat audacious. You know, this is really a great piece of work. The tenth letter, the concluding letter. He addresses this to the Apostle John. <laughs> he addresses it to John to John the theologian, the apostle, the evangelist, in exile on the island of Patmos. <coughs> John, therefore, is the author of Revelations. That's what he's saying. Right? He is the author of Revelation. Therefore, what's he doing? Well, what he's doing is quite interesting. I'm going to go to the conclusion of it, which is on page 160. For the present, we shall read these writings, these writings, in the memory and renewal of this, your true teaching about God. And in short, and in short while, we shall be joined to you, I am trustworthy concerning the things prophesied of God about you, having uh, both learned and then stated that you will leave the prison on Patmos, You'll return to Asia Minor and there produce imitations of the good God and leave them to prosperity. What's he? He has a revelation. This is his revelation. For the present, we shall read these writings in the memory and renewal of this true teachings about God. Right? And I prophesy that you'll get off the island and you'll go to Asia Minor, you'll do well. Therefore, he calls this the oracle. He's writing it, considers it as an oracle, considers it as a divine revelation in competition with John. At the, and those days, since they thought it was written by the companion to St. Paul, it then gained equal status to Holy Scripture for a thousand years until they finally realized it was a fraud and they dumped it. So what can we do? I just wanted to take you through this to show you that we can go back the other way. 
Therefore, by becoming more and more familiar with this, second nature, we will really be getting a quick, concise shortcut into Greek metaphysics and philosophy. Relatively painless. Relatively, depending upon your aptitude and how much you're willing to get into it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you. And everyone, and everyone has a copy. You don't want to put one, two, and three in in the last. Oh yes, yes I do, but it, it, yeah, yeah. But um, if we you look at one, questions? if I do, she's not going to get an answer. Oh, is she? I'm sorry. She asks, "What are you going to do about one, two, and three? If you take a look at one and two and three, that deals with the highest good, the nature of God. So one and two and three gives a view of God as the highest good, as a one." And therefore, it caps it. Three talks about the need for the sudden, the turnabout, to find out what lies beyond being, because you want to see what comes forth from its concealment. And that whole idea of coming forth from its concealment is nothing other than creation. Our own, what happens to ourselves, or what God does to the universe. That's a quick dusting off of one, two, and three, if I've ever heard one. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, okay, so these were written in the 6th century? 530. 532, maybe, at latest, the latest, 532. But reported to have been written. Pardon me? But reported to have been written before that, 500 years before. Yes, well, you see, it's designed in a way, that, after all, that he knows John. Oh, okay. And he knows where he is, and he's writing him, Dear John, how are you? And it also... There's a very nice description of the crucifixion. He, therefore, he is asserting in this uh, seventh letter that he was at the, at the crucifixion. Therefore, he's the only one who was thought ever to have been given a record of the crucifixion. Therefore, he ups all of the apostles. They weren't there. Therefore, he's the only one. He's the one that was the companion of Paul and then goes beyond John. What is he doing? He's lifting and his own writings above the Bible, and that's the way it was accepted for quite a number of years. As equal to, yeah. Now, where he talks about his methodology of separating the associations and getting to the mystical... Yeah, right, right where... We, that's the symbolic theology, that's what we were going to get into. I'd like to get into it some more. That's letter nine, symbolic theology. What is to stop using that methodology on any piece of writing? Let's say if we look at a book yes. which is about yes. creating that lectern, and we can use the same methodology yes. because yes. in truth there is nothing holy mm -hmm. about the Bible if we take his point of view. That's I right. mean, Republic might be holy, That's but right. the Bible definitely isn't. That's absolutely right. I don't get it. If you understand it without, if you understand how to translate each of these symbols and images, you don't need the Bible. That's right. And you could use anything. You could. That's right. Then you, you go know, into Homer. You, you go in the Old Testament. You could even you could even look at National Enquirer. Of course. And do the same yes, thing. that's right. Wait. That's right. You can say, oh, Find look at this. It represents on a yeah. higher level. In the National Enquirer. If you yes. have, if you're high, yes. if you're high enough on the thing, you can see something profound in any pornographic piece of literature. Or anything. Yeah. There was a recent study by a guy. I really, I really this enjoyed it. I didn't get his name, but yeah, it's just a, a fun point. Um, this theologian decided that he would have a little fun with researchers, so he conducted a study and said, "I have an empirical way of identifying people who are very religious. Number one, they must have God on their minds all the time." And two, they must have some creative process in their mind all the time. And he said, therefore, I went out and I found, therefore, that there are a bunch of people who talk about God all the time and talk about generation in a certain way. <laughs> Curses. <laughs> people who curse all the time have God on their mind, do they not? And they're all into biology and sexuality, are they not? Generation. Therefore, he showed that they, therefore, must be very holy people, according to the normal standards of our empirical world. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I missed last time. How did they find out it was a fraud? 
Pardon? How can we? How did they find out it was a fraud? Or a Lorenzo Valla. We have to. You have to get. You have. We have to look into Lorenzo Valla. He is the one who opened up it all. He opened up so many forgeries of the church. But he. His greatest, his greatest achievement was using one word, likelihood. And he said, is it likely that, is it likely that, is it likely that? And one of the arguments was, is it likely that, that this could be uh, as magnificent as it is and not be known for five, 530 years? Is it likely, therefore, that if, if it was found near Syria? Is it likely that the people who are bringing it over here uh, recently discovered it? Or did they, is it more likely that they didn't discover it all, but they may in fact have made it up? <laughs> Isn't it likely that for 500 years, if all the great uh, theologians never once mentioned it, isn't it likely that perhaps they didn't mention it, not because they wanted to keep it secret, because it didn't exist? Isn't it likely? But but he expresses this in the highest level in his work on the donation of Constantine. That's where he really takes this theory of likelihood to really a beautiful level. Now the people then had much more sense because you could use the same thing about Shard of Turin, you could do carbon-14 dating as well as is it yeah, likely, yeah. and mm -hmm. still people will believe that the Shard is yeah. not a forgery. Well, he would say, let them believe it. They're going to get exactly whatever it is, whatever level they are, that's what they're going to see. Is that how come the church believed him? My point is that there must be more enlightenment then, yes. or less, at least, people... Uh, I mean, I'm really surprised that people believed him then. Well, if you, if you, get, if you have more practice believing, you'll find. <laughs> you can believe anything. Thank you. Thank you.